members Jason Dozier and Council Member uh, Dustin Hillis. Um, at this time, colleagues, I just wanted to inform you, the committee that we do have a walk-in paper. Um, so with that being said, I will entertain an, um, a motion to adopt the agenda. Got a motion by Hillis, a second by Shook. Mr. Johnson, can you please open the vote? The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. Agenda has been adopted. Thank you. And at this time, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Second by Shook. Can you please open the vote? The vote is open. The vote is closed. Five yeas, zero nays. The minutes have been approved. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. And at this time, we'll open it up for public comments. Do we have any speakers today? Mr. Chair, we have no one signed up, but there's a lady here that I'd like to speak. Sure. One speaker, we, we, we'll, we'll let you <laughs> do it today. Uh, Ms. 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 Adrian. Yes, good morning. Again, I'm here to speak to um, um, public access television. As you know, the uh, contract with People TV ends on June the 5th. Um, and um, the question is, what happens June the 6th? Um, a year ago, around the same time, City of Atlanta entered into a contract with People TV. Well, they didn't. First of all, this, the, you know, what the city did was reclaim the channel, um, and the Bottoms administration um, had um, plans to um, move public access forward. They had a six-phase plan that they presented to council, and they initiated that to actually reclaim the channel. Shortly after that happened, um, the Dickens administration decided to stop that process and to give a contract to People TV. Well, there's several issues at play here. Number one, we're like two weeks away before that contract ends. People TV, the city can't contract with People TV for several reasons. Number one, the board is illegal. Um, and if you review the uh, rene recent um, FEC committee on the municipal market, you can't contract with a board, the board, all the representatives on that board, their term ended, and for several, their term ended years ago. It was illegal when you contracted with them in 2021, I mean, in 2022. In addition, People TV's board, a public board of the city of Atlanta, hasn't met in 16 months consecutively. Okay, so pretty much that board has abandoned their fiduciary responsibilities and governance of the public access channel. There are many stakeholders in this city that are eager to activate that channel and the um, facilities, educational opportunities, and are willing to put forth a plan. And we have not, the Dickens administration has not engaged the community in any meaningful way. I've attended the two um, public hearings. There was 15 people total combined, distinct people that attended those meetings. Eight people submitted con comments in that RFI, two of which are open, um, wanted to bid on the contract. So that's six Atlanta residents. So they have not engaged in that. So again, I was disappointed, Mr. Chair, to see that this was not on the agenda for today. We have not heard from the administration in terms of what they learned in the RFI and what their plans are. So I have no problem. I would like to wait. I would like for somebody representative from the mayor's office to come and tell this committee and the public what the plans are. I would also in, ask you, Mr. Chair, to schedule the work session on this matter so that we can really have some dialogue about what the next steps need to be. I personally hope that <laughs> Juneteenth that we liberate Atlanta's public access channel, that we really return it back to the people and that we make some action. So I thank you for your time this morning and allowing me to speak. Thank you. And, and Ms. Coleman, I, I do understand your concerns around um, you know, community media, public access, access TV. Um, I have been in contact with um, Brian Thomas, uh, Director of Communications for the Mayor. And, I, and it is my understanding that the information that was taken from the recent RFI is available to the public uh, on the website, www.atlantaga.gov. Um, backslash community media. So if you can go to that website, you'll be able to find more information uh, about the upcoming RFP. Thank you. So 
At this time, um, we do have a presentation today. Um, Commissioner uh, Browning with Department of Watershed Management. All right, good morning. <clears throat> Chairman Winston, City Utility Committee members, uh, thank you for allowing me the opportunity to update you on DWM's progress in third quarter of fiscal year 2023 uh, for the period of January through March of this year. Advancing to slide three, this illustrates DWM's department organizational chart. Next, I'll cover administrative and financial highlights. So we've advanced into slide five. Uh, this provides an update regarding our personnel status. Again, this is for uh, the period of January through March. Uh, these numbers are a little bit larger than what was presented during my budget hearing. Uh, we've done some scrubbing and haircuts, so those numbers were, were lower that were presented during budget. Uh, but for the reporting period, DWM's number of authorized positions were 1,604 positions with 1,273 filled and 331 vacancies. So our percent field is roughly 79% and vacancy rate is roughly uh, 20%, which was down from the previous quarter by 4%. So we're continuing to focus our efforts to fill mission critical positions within our core operations offices and are continuing to increase recruitment efforts. Next several slides, so I'll be covering our financials. And so uh, slide six provides a snapshot of our third quarter FY23 financials. Um, our o and expenditures were roughly 74% for personnel and roughly 57% for non-personnel budget allocations. As of March, our fiscal year actual revenues were at roughly 515.6 million while our expenses were within budget at 459.5 million. Slide eight provides a graphic that illustrates our revenues. Again, fiscal year 22 actuals in comparison to fiscal year 23 projections and actuals. Uh, fiscal year 23 actuals continue to outpace projections and are even higher than fiscal year 23, 22 actuals. So our revenues continue to be on a steady and solid climb month over month and year over year. Advancing to slide nine, this provides a summary of our municipal option sales tax revenues through March. Our, our most revenues are continuing to trend higher than projections by uh, nearly two million monthly and continues to be a positive for the department. Advancing the slides uh, 10 through 13, this provides an update on our care and conserve program, including our bill payment, LEWAP, and plumbing assistance support services provided to customers. Uh, again, the program is charged with assisting single family, low to moderate income residential customers who are experiencing financial hardships with outstanding water bills and plumbing repairs. Thus far for this fiscal year, DWM has assisted a total of 839 customers and roughly 1.9 million in assistance has been provided. We're continuing to refer customers in need to our LEWAP program. Um, customers have benefited from nearly 1.3 million from the program. Similarly, DWM has provided nearly 66,000 in bill payment assistance, as well as 536,000 in plumbing assistance. And so through the expanded care and conserve program that now includes restoration support for low income customers uh, impacted by sewer backups and water damage. Uh, an additional 900,000 was allocated for the expanded program. And to date, we there's three homes that we began restoration implementation. Uh, that process began in fiscal year, I mean, sorry, in February, 2023. Um, and two homes have been completed to date. So we got underway with that work um, pretty diligently. Next, I'll cover our operational highlights. If you advance to slide 15, 
Uh, this provides the department's progress by the numbers relating our core services and functions for the period. Slide 16 provides an update on DWM's internal metrics. Uh, we observed the continued downward trend in ONM and power utilization for drinking water treatment, uh, continued compliance for drinking water and wastewater compliance. Uh, we're beginning to see a much needed downward trend in the number of water main breaks and with a slight uptick in new water um, leak work orders for the period. Slide 17 covers our Office of Water, uh, Office of Watership Protection SLA. Our average for the quarter was 95.3%, um, up from last quarter's 94%. Slide 18 covers our Office of Customer Care and Billing Services, which continues at 100% SLA for the period. Uh, meanwhile, slide 19 um, provides our Office of Linear Infrastructure Operations. SLA for the period was 93%, which was down from last period's 95.6%. Uh, the reduction is attributed to some of the overage from freezing weather conditions during that first quarter uh, that you know, continued into the first quarter. Um, our OLEO management did conduct a review of performance for teams with missed SLAs to determine root costs and corrective actions to address underperformance. Um, a few of the deficiencies, deficiencies identified include failure to monitor system and updates regarding job completions, lack of, a little bit of lack of understanding of the system and interpreting the data uh, to appropriately schedule work and effectively manage workloads. Um, and so corrective actions taken include training and retooling the staff um, and reiteration of expectations and the SLAs. Um, we are expecting improvements to be reflected in the May data uh, which would be the fourth quarter. Uh, that is forthcoming. And we are continuing to work with Department of HR to fill critical vacancies, uh, to add additional crews and increase the team's capacity. Advancing to slide 20, I just provides an update on Office of Linear Infrastructure Service Requests. 49% of the service requests were related to our Sewer Collections Division while 51% were related to the Water Distribution Division. Next, I'll cover compliance. Advancing to slides 22 and 23, uh, so we experienced 12 NPDES violations during the reporting period, so it was a little bit of a rough period for us. Uh, three violations in January and nine in March. Uh, we experienced exceedances and phosphorus ammonia and total suspended solids at our Arm Clayton and South River WRCs. Uh, the exceedances were due to spikes detected in the influent wastewater streams. Um, so we're coordinating with our industrial pretreatment program to try and trace and identify the sources. Uh, the change in wastewater stream is you know, forcing us to change how we treat the influent wastewater. We're closely monitoring the spikes and reporting these exceedances to EPD uh, per our permit requirements. Uh, compliance, of course, continues to be top priority for the department and the team is focused on accountability and compliance with the permit requirements. So I'm very confident we'll get over this um, hump with these, um, these illicit discharges that are coming in. Uh, next couple of slides, I'll cover and you know, summarize the uh, activities related to our site development division. Uh, for the period, 765 permits were issued uh, for both single family, residential, and commercial, including multifamily and subdivisions. There were 1,967 plan reviews uh, completed for the reporting period, both new and resubmittals. And also personal updates and progress with filling critical vacancies within the site development team. Uh, we have a hybrid team in place to support with support from our AE resources to support the daily efforts. And we're also making good efforts with identifying and hiring internal candidates. Advancing to slide 27, provide an update regarding our environmental and construction enforcement activities. 
uh, as requested. You know, the team completed a total of 3,829 inspections uh, for the period, which is up from the previous quarter of 2,798. Uh, 3,260 site visits were found to be in compliance, um, and 569 sites were found to be in non-compliance. Uh, the team issued 212 stop work orders, which are up from the previous quarter of 123. 22 citations were issued for the reporting period, which is up from the previous quarter's nine. We had 16 court sessions attended, uh, up double from the last quarter, which were eight. And our fines for the period was 3,175 levied, which was up from last quarter's 912. Uh, so the next couple of slides will provide a more granular breakdown of the totals of each of the activities and actions taken by council district and the reporting period. And since the last quarterly update and based on feedback received um, from committee members, we've implemented enhancements to our enforcement efforts. We've taken a zero tolerance approach to the issuance of citations. So that's been enacted. Um, if a project site remains out of compliance after a compliance period of a stop work order, citations are now issued uh, per day, per count. Uh, we've reinstituted our weekend inspections of sites under stop work orders. Uh, we've reinstituted that post COVID. And basically our enforcement data, you know, illustrates that the monthly citations written in the division have doubled since January. So strong focus on uh, enforcement by the team. Next I'll cover customer service and related initiatives. Um, so if you advance to slide 33, provides an overview of a SMART initiative project that I'm excited about. Um, and those are our advanced metering infrastructure AMI pilot program. Uh, we're looking to advance upgrades to our 180,000 network of water meters uh, with SMART meters. Uh, water policy and regulatory standpoints, made, there's a major push for water utilities to migrate to SMART meters and incorporate SMART sensors to address water loss and system leaks. So we'll be transitioning from AMR, which is the drive-by meter reading, to AMI, which is a remote reading. Uh, AMI, which is an integrated system of smart uh, meters, communication networks, and data management systems that enable two-way communication between the utilities and the customers. And so customers and operations will have uh, near real-time water usage information 24-7. Uh, leaks will be detected quicker reducing surprise bills and will mitigate water loss. Um, services can be started and stopped remotely, which improves service levels um, and optimizes resources and supports sustainability with fewer trucks on the road. Uh, we're looking to initiate the pilot by deploying 200 smart meters across two service regions. We've selected two products. We conducted an RFI about a year and a half ago and looked at several products uh, very thoughtfully. And so um, pending legislative approval, um, we'll be looking to put funds in place, uh, about $1.7 million, and we'll look to start the pilot in quarter four of this calendar year. Advancing to slide 34, uh, provides an overview of a few customer service enhancements about which we are also excited. We now have a dedicated phone number. That's 404-546-WATER. Customers can connect with Department of Watershed Management directly to address water bill related issues and matters, as well as hear about active water service outages. And the anticipated go live for this future is June 1st of this year. We'll also be instituting an interactive map on our website www.atlantawatershed.org, which illustrates locations across the city that are impacted by interruptions in service. Um, customers will also be able to report an outage that will link them back to ATL 311. And so we're looking to beta this interactive map June 1st 
uh, would it anticipate to go live of July 1st of this year. We're also instituting customer outreach via text message and robocalls to inform customers of water interruptions. Customers will be able to indicate their preferred method of contact via their water bill by speaking with one of our customers. Next, I'll cover our capital improvements program. You advance to slide 36. Our five-year CIP is just shy of one billion and comprised of 94 active projects. Uh, there's still a heavy focus on consent decree, uh, but strong focus on our water and wastewater facilities as they are aging assets as well. And we're continuing to balance capital investments across our operations to ensure that we're completing upgrades to our most critical assets. If you advance through slides 37 through 42, these just provide a few updates on some notable capital projects. You've got the Upper Proctor Creek Capacity Relief um, Projects. There was a Phase A that was completed last year. Uh, we recently completed Phase B. Um, and phase C will be completed um, soon. We have our Northport storage tank and pump station project. Um, we are finalizing a um, ground lease with GDOT for that project, and so we'll look to get underway with that this summer. We have our sewer group four small diameter rehab contracts. There's a contract A and B. Um, that are currently underway that furthers the necessary structural improvements to our sewers pursuant to our consent decrees. We also have our Entrenchment Creek um, Water Reclamation Center decommissioning project that is continuing, um, that's underway. And lastly, we have our Custer Avenue Multi-Benefit Capacity Relief Project. Um, it's a project that we are um, looking to activate this fall. It's in procurement phase right now um, to address the localized flooding and sewer overflows within the uh, People's Town community. All right, in closing, I want to recognize and give a tremendous thanks to the men and women of the Department of Watershed Management for their continued hard work and support in providing vital water services to the residents of Atlanta. I'm subject to your questions, this concludes my quarterly update. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Commissioner Browning, for that thorough quarterly update. Um, at this time, I'll open it up for comments and questions from my colleagues. I see the speaker queue is starting to fill up here, so let me get started with that. Uh, we'll start off with uh, Council Member Dozier. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Commissioner Browning. Uh, just a quick question. One of the things that, that stood out to me with your presentation was the, with the customer outreach that y'all have been working on uh, with the notifications to folks who are experiencing uh, water outages. I know you and I have talked in the past about how can we make the communication channels better, and I appreciate y'all working hard and diligently to, to get this service online. I was curious, is this being managed by the Department of Customer Service or is this being managed by the Department of Watershed Management? I know we have our Notify ATL system, but is this a separate system or is that nested within our existing So it's been, been managed under the Department of Watershed Management in coordination with other team members such as ATL 311. Okay. Yeah. And then and July 1st is when we think well, is definitely going to be the go live for that? We are anticipating the go live to be July, July 1st. And I guess just on that front, what is the the outreach to promote the outreach going to look like? Are y'all putting things in people's water bills? Are y'all yep. okay? Yeah. So um, starting with our May bill, I believe we were we looked to put um, uh, priority numbers um, on those water bills and um, introduce the new number uh, to customers, and so. Um, we're going to continue to progress that outreach, you know, a banner on our website um, so we can let customers know of, you know, the new, new ways that they can get in contact with us and notify us of any issues. Okay. And, and the reason why I asked about the Department of Customer Service piece as well was I know as a city we're broadly trying to get residents and constituents to participate in a Notify ATL program. And so uh, I would hate to, to have 
any confusion with the various calls to action to sign up for information. Yep. And the more that we can kill two birds with one stone, Same. I think it'll be helpful for, for community members, especially their under you don't know, want folks saying, hey, I signed up for a thing mm -hmm. and didn't get this message when they signed up for something that was very specific. Um, so just wanted to offer that feedback. Well, I appreciate y'all taking this step and I want to be able to butt the hell out of it because I know. <laughs> Thank you for that feedback. Way. We'll make sure that um, we're synced um, with the ATL notification and um, that there's no redundancies, but it's the proper overlap so that we're, we're reaching our, our constituency. So. And then just my other question is, is the operational question for like the cash basins y'all are cleaning up, the, uh, um, the water main covers that y'all are repairing, the, those sorts of kind of operational um, things that y'all do on in, day in and day out. Uh, what percentage of our city's assets are y'all repairing or cleaning or managing on a month to month basis? I see the raw numbers here, but I'm curious, how does that look in, the, in terms of the overall? So of course, I don't have those, those uh, figures in front of me, but yeah, we do look to clean, repair, um, inspect percentages of our system for our assets each year. I can certainly get that and share that with you. Okay. And um, I know oftentimes we rely on 311 and I know our offices will reach out to you and your team for support. But I'm just curious how much that's caught in our regular inspections and the regular yeah. work. And so that's really the, the crux of that question. Yes. Yeah, so as much as we have, you know, the reactive work that we do, preventive maintenance is a really big part of what we do. Um, if we build it, we got to maintain it and all asset types. And so that's... Um, Coupled a part of our preventive maintenance and our asset management program. Well, that, that's all I have. Thank you to you and your team and everything y'all do. Mr. Chair, you Thank you, Councilmember Dozier. Uh, I did want to acknowledge that we've been joined by Councilmember Antonio Lewis. Uh, and next, we'll have uh, Councilmember Shook. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Um, seeing that you're gearing up to do another uh, mass replacement of water meters made me reflect on the fact that I guess I'm Council's sole survivor from the last effort. I'm not going to go into that, but I am going to ask you to say what you believe are the lessons learned that you're going to apply to this project. So I vaguely remember that phase when the city went through a mass overhaul. Of replacement. Fill in a lot of detail, <laughs> but, but I'm going to await your answer. Yeah, um, we're being very thoughtful about the approach. Um, it's going to be a very um, strategic and if not surgical approach to how we um, replace and upgrade the meters. Again, we want to get through the pilot. We've got, we think, two good products that have been selected. Um, the pilot will allow us to see how those products perform in the field. Um, so we'll take the lessons learned from the previous and more strategy about how we deploy the meters, ensuring that they're sync with our billing system, ensuring that there's quality control in regards to how the meters are uh, installed, um, and just working really closely with community outreach as we deploy the meters in the different communities and across the city that we are communicating really highly with our customers to let them know what's going on. And I think we'll have the structure and the infrastructure in place to address any issues that come about. If there's any anomalies, no different from what we do right now, if there's any anomalies with water um, billings. Um, but I think for us right now, we'll, we're going to, you know, really tiptoe into this pilot, see how the products um, perform, understand lessons learned. Of course, we benchmark other cities that have undertaken this, so we're, we're going to take from the lessons learned from those cities as well. Uh, how long do you think it's going to take to replace all those meters? I'm anticipating it's going to take probably three to five years. There would be a separate contract in place to, to assist with the deployment. I like hearing that because one of the mistakes that was made last time was the then commissioner thought the city would save a whole lot of money by doing what at that time was considered to be three years worth of work to telescope that into two. That was the wrong decision. That's 
one of my biggest regrets looking back. We all thought it sounded good too. And then, you know, your people are going to have to look very carefully over the shoulders of the contractors and the subs yep. because meters were put in the wrong way. Yep. People couldn't tell the difference between, you know, half inch and three quarter inch. That happened to my meter. Um, so just project management has to be tight and right and, you know, take your time, you know, measure twice and cut once. But Absolutely. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Shook. Next we have Councilmember Dustin Hillis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the presentation, Commissioner Browning. Uh, a few questions. First is um, just thinking about project delivery. Notice there's a vacancy in procurement planning in your contract administrator. Um, what is the update on that? Has that been posted? Is that it's been filled. We now have a director of procurement planning and strategic sourcing. Um, on the most revenues, um, I believe those are all allocated to stormwater projects. Is that correct? Or 10%. I, how much? 10%. 10%, okay. And the rest, what is the rest of the allocation? Goes to the rest of our infrastructure, water, wastewater infrastructure. Gotcha. Um, storm drains and catch basin clogs. I saw that. That's the, the one I'll pick apart this um, mm -hmm. update going from 95 to 80 to 78. And this, of course, isn't the fall. This is spring going into summer, or I guess uh, winter going into spring. This, uh, much you covered what's the uh, issue with that and how is your partnership with public works going to keep uh, the streets swept and clean and kind of avoid those yes of course we we support our our brother department public works with the street sweeping program um so what we do as far as our cleaning of the catch basins and related storm infrastructure We'll hopefully complement what they're doing. Uh, we're trying to still sync up schedules, um, not just within the combined area, but across the city um, to make sure that our efforts are complementing each other. So we do work with them um, diligently to make sure that our schedule is aligned as much as possible. But, um, you know, it, it's still very much a, a top priority for us. I think we may have had some um, folks out and um, reduce, you know, efforts because of um, people being out that first quarter. But um, they're ramping it up. We monitor the production on a monthly basis, and um, again, that falls into our preventive maintenance program. So it's a top priority for us. And I know we've had a few of these issues and trains on my district. Is what is your escalation process of just a train that continually gets clogged? You know almost monthly or bi-monthly or is there an upgrade process for that drain or area? Yeah, so when we continue to get re you know, repeat um, complaints for issues that are related to maintenance, we'll begin to look at it. Do we need to look at a retrofit? Is the structure appropriate um, based on a drainage that's occurring there? Um, so we, it's two things. We either look at it from a hydraulic standpoint and need to do an, an upgrade to the, the asset and or ramp up preventive maintenance to make sure that it stays clean um, and isn't clogged. Uh, notice uh, in the impeds violations, RMC had a number of them. Yes. I read through what the issues were. Um, where is that currently and are there any current or pending projects is going to address those issues or uh, continue to get lots yeah. of complaints about uh, the aromas uh, in and around RMC. So. Hey, thanks for bringing that up. So I think we've found the root cause for um, the aroma. Uh, <laughs> we basically, um, our in Clayton is um, the facility that we use for septic haulers to discharge their flows. And so, um, we have a significant amount of customers that visit the facility and utilize it. And so we're working to um, change the location um, for septic haulers to discharge their flows. 
Um, so we're working to get a um, discharge basin installed at Utoy Creek, which is um, south of south of here. Um, better location, mainly commercial industrial. Um, Coupled with the fact that the, the facility's waste stream is a little bit weaker, so um, that waste would probably help to strengthen it. So it just all around be a better location, and we think that that'll medi mitigate a lot of the, the odor issues that's occurring at Arm Clayton. Um, with regard to some of the exceedances, again, you know, basically we have some um, some bad actors that are discharging some strong flows into um, the sewers. And so that really saturated um, flow comes to the plant um, and it's throwing off our treatment process a bit. Um, and so we're working to combat that with um, additional chemical additions and you know, additional um, bugs that we feed in order to uptake some of those, um, those, those excess nutrients. Um, but the most important thing we got to do is uh, pinpoint who is the culprit. And so working with our, it, it, nine times out of 10, it's going to be um, an industrial user. So work with our industrial pretreatment program to work with them to identify who is the culprit. Um, sometimes, you know, commercial industrial users may discharge, you know, that super saturated flow off peak. And so we'll be doing some monitoring off peak of various different um, commercial users and just really try to figure out who's, who's the culprit. And once we find out who they are, we'll take the necessary steps for enforcement. And on the point about the septic haulers, is that a necessity or a choice that we provide that service? And if either way, uh, what is the fee uh, for intaking that? And has that fee been updated recently? Great question. So yes, it's uh, it is voluntary. Most agencies, most water agencies, do um, permit um, septic haulers to discharge at some of the, their um, public owned facilities, and so we're no different. Um, uh, adding to your point, I, we looked at our fees recently. They're they're very attractive. Uh, hence the reason why we're seeing. Um, you know, such large um, customer base for haulers. Um, so as part of those um, department-wide fee updates, we'll be proposing an update to the septic hauling fee. Right now it's $80 per thousand gallons. Um, and so we'll be adjusting that up appropriately. I didn't have it written down here, but I walked into that question. What, what is the current timeline on the fee updates? <laughs> The legislation is being ready. Um, we're going to try and work it into uh, probably cycle 13. I uh, just want to thank you and your team uh, for the enhancement on the enforcement piece. Uh, you mentioned the court cases going from 8 to 16. I just ask that you uh, and your team keep that up, and uh, hopefully we'll see a decrease, but not because we're not enforcing, but because people finally know that we're, we're watching serious them. about this and we're, we're watching them. Um, Thank you also for the uh, programs around notif notification of service interruptions and uh, getting those updates out to folks. I'm uh, excited to see those go live and look forward to getting that to the, the neighborhoods in my district and, and using them. Um, one thing we haven't talked about in a while is uh, Hemp Hill Reservoir 2. Uh, what is the current status and update on that reservoir and getting any needed repairs, uh, get that Reservoir back up to full status. So we got reservoir one and two. Two, um, there's some um, repairs that need to be done, and we're working to get um, funding in place in order to complete those repairs. And that's the one where uh, Beltline Path is going to wrap around. We were in conversations with them about. Um, forging that, you know, pushing that forward and permitting that. And I think there's some things that they have to do in order to see that project to fruition. Um, as well as Reservoir 1, we are still um, uh, looking at that, that reservoir for what the improvements are going to be um, for that. So we're working... The reservoir 1 is the eastern reservoir? Reservoir 1 is the one that's closer to the hill. And oh, the... I had them flip-flop. So yeah, that yeah. was the one I was... 
yeah. asking about. We're meant to ask about the one yeah, that the has leaking been one. So it's stage. still it's still not back at full pool. We're working with a, one of our consulting engineers. We, they've done an evaluation of it. Um, we'll be looking to probably repurpose that that space. Um, I think we have to be very thoughtful about um, what repairs are going to be needed um, since we've had the leakage. So we'll be determining how much pool we want to remain, but there's some operational use that we think we may want to use for that space. Um, but ultimately compliance is top priority for us for that one as well. Um, last item, um, what is an update on our delinquent accounts, the collection, putting people on payment plans, cutoffs, write-offs, all of the above? We're working on all of the above. Um, you know, so when we started on this effort you know, roughly a year or two ago, we were at 130. I think at present we we'd gone down to about 121 million. I think we saw a little bit of an uptick to 123. So we're continuing to make um, diligent efforts to address the arrears. Um, you know, so we have active accounts and we have some inactive accounts. Um, we'll be putting forth um, legislation to address some of the dated arrears for active accounts and we'll be working with uh, the CFO to address write-offs for some of the inactive accounts. And then I think you said 121 million is what it's down to? Yep. I think it's been a while since we got an update so out of that if that's the number then what amount of that would likely be write-offs? Uh, the number as of today is 124,724,700,000. We can't write off active accounts. We have to go through a process of them being dormant for a year. I'm sorry, Jonathan Williams Financial Administration. Uh, we have to um, go through every process we can to collect, and they have to be dormant for a year before we can touch those. In the inactive accounts, we've got $9 million in uh, administrative that have already been processed. And there's 31.7 million that's on the CFO's desk now for reduction. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Brown. Okay. okay. Thank you, Councilmember Hillis. Uh, next, we'll have comments and questions from Councilmember Andrea Boone. Thank you, Commissioner, for your hard work and dedication. Um, your staff has been working with the Westview community um, for several, several months. And the neighbors seem to think that they're great progress. Could you give me a little update about what's going on over there in Rogers Avenue, South Gordon? They've been working very hard with your team on that. Yeah, thank you for that question, now, Councilmember Boone. So, uh, to your point, we've been meeting with the community for several months now. Um, like other some other communities within the city, there's been some localized flooding and drainage challenges within Westview. Uh, we onboarded a, or enlisted one of our AE teams, engineering teams, to do a review and assessment of the location. Uh, I believe we had a meeting with the community just last week. Um, so, you know, we're looking at their analysis and you know, working with them to determine what the best solutions are going to be. Also, the heavy flooding. Um, on ML King Jr. Drive near the Wayfield Foods, your team has been working very diligently with that community. Yes, yes. So we, you know, sent out our stormwater um, investigation team that um, became aware of that matter at um, the town hall meeting. You, you, um, thank you for inviting us to participate in. So um, there's some preliminary results for MLK um, that have come in. I need to review those a little bit more in detail and work with the team to determine what's going to be the solution to address that localized flooding that's occurring at that location. Okay, and the last huge flooding issue is at Doctors Memorial Park at Fairburn and Benjamin E. Mays Drive. Fairburn and Benjamin E. Mays Drive. So I, we've not gotten to that location yet. You know, there were several locations that were brought up um, at the town hall meeting um, to date. You know, again, they've looked at the MLK location. Um, they've looked at the Flamingo Drive location. 
there was Shelley Payton also. And in Shelley at Payton, there were several properties that um, staff conducted site visits to about two weeks ago, due to get an update from them on their investigation and findings for. And so um, I do recall that the Fairburn um, at Benjamin Mays location came up. So that'll be next in queue for investigations. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Councilmember Boone. Next, we'll have questions and comments from Councilmember Antonio Lewis. Thank you, Chair. And Ms. Ms. Brownie, I appreciate you so much for the work that you've been doing in District 12 uh, to see the, I always talk about the barbershop, but it's no longer flooding in front of the barbershop. And the repavement of the roads is saving folks driving into that area. So I appreciate you for uh, the hard work and dedication there. I also wanted to uh, talk about a new issue that I wanted to bring up. 2314 Perkinson Road. Uh, every time it rains, I get pictures from over there and I'll share the photos with you. But if we can go and talk to Ms. Dis Denson about uh, some of the stuff that's going on over in front of that road on Perkinson. The, I wanted to highlight some big issues going on in District 12 because uh, we've solved one of the first one. I feel like we've, uh, we're, we're working on that portion, so I want to highlight, put these on your plate. Pool Creek flooding again. A pool Creek flooding. Every, this week is the last week of school. My nephew, he's practicing for graduation. Last, yesterday when they were going in, he had to go around the other way because you know that flood, it turned into a small pond whenever they try to walk through it. So Pool Creek flooding. South River. My goal is to be able to kayak, kayak and canoe through South River. And so put that on your, so the, we, everybody's talking about South River. We got to go and shoot the hooch this summer. I want to be able to shoot South River on floats. And so that's my big picture for the next. You've already solved the biggest issue in District 12, and I appreciate you for reaching out to the Army Corps of Engineers, but know that in my term, I want to be able to float. I know it takes time, so that's the big picture. So that's why I'm asking you to fix all these feeder streams that go into South River, because I want to be able to float Pool Creek, Lake Wood, and all those in our backyards, because I know we can if we get it flowing. Thank you. Thank you for that input. Thank you, Councilmember Lewis. Thank you, colleagues, for your thorough questions. A, a, a lot of thunder was taken for some questions that I had, but uh, I'm, I'm glad you were very thorough in your answers. Um, just sharing some of the same, um, you know, um, I, I guess happiness about the, 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 the new notification system that's, that's, that's forthcoming. Uh, so excited to see that. I know that that's a frequent email that we get from customers, or not customers, but constituents on our end. Uh, about some of the water cutoffs or some of the issues happening in, in different areas and just wanting to know kind of what's going on. So I, I appreciate being able to see that. Um, I do share some of the concerns that Councilmember Hillis addressed around the violations um, and the enforcement going around that. I, I would like to know since, you know, some of this seems to be coming from some industrial companies that, that may be at adding to some of these issues. Could you go in a little bit more detail about what the enforcement looks like um, from your end? So. The industrial users, um, they're issued a permit by us. And there are, uh, DC Mahajra, if you could step up, I believe there's um, periodic inspections that are conducted by our teams to make sure that um, those users are in compliance. Um, and so, you know, they take samples of their their wastewater discharges to make sure that they are um, within um, limits um, for the discharge permit. And if they're out of compliance, they're, they're issued an you know, enforcement warning um, of a second reinspection and then before it becomes a citation. Um, and so, you know, the information I've gathered from staff is, you know, by and large, most of the users are in compliance. Um, but again, we've seen, you know, historically over the years where there's some, you know, some of the permittees may do wonky things, um, you know, off peak and, um, you know, under the radar. And so we have to do a little bit more investigation in order to, to really pinpoint and determine um, who's the culprit and what's the issue. So. 
I'll let DC Mahadra talk a little bit more okay. about the enforcement piece for. Good morning, uh, morning. Alex Mahajer, Office of the Watership Protection. Uh, we are in a process of boosting our surveillance activities and and a lot of the problems that a uh, lot of the municipalities have is uh, the illicit discharges that, that happens without, you know, just just happens as it owns. At the middle of the night, they come and dump something and, and we end up as the recipient of it uh, to deal with it. And um, so this would include uh, increasing our surveillance and possibly uh, uh, adding some uh, samplers and to find out if there is a let's say discharge received from an area which sector you come from so then we can work it upstream to find out the uh, uh, the institution or the municipalities or uh, other areas that they could be contributing to that so um, so we are in the process of you know boosting up our activities here Another nuance is that, you know, we, we take where we are a regional provider, and so we do get wastewaters from other neighboring communities. So working with those, um, you know, similar industrial pretreatment programs to try and understand if there's any noncompliance with, you know, businesses that are within their, their communities that may be um, the culprit as well. So that tracing is what's underway now to pinpoint who might be or who might be the um, might be the culprit and source of okay and then um, change the subject uh, a little bit uh, I I've just know for myself I've seen an uptick in, in issues concerning flooding in some of our local parks especially in district 1 butting up against district 12 uh, we've, we've had some issues in Browns Mill Park Four Corners Park, Grant Park uh, just wanted to just know if you could talk through some of your efforts, maybe working with Parks and Rec uh, to be able to kind of alleviate some of these issues. That's a good question. So, um, you know, by and large, we have our assets mapped pretty well. Um, we do have assets that go through public parks. Um, and so we take full responsibility for um, that infrastructure. There is some infrastructure within parks that's not under watershed purview and under parks' purview. Um, and when we encounter those types of situations, um, you know, we will extend our, our technical skills and expertise to DPR and helping them to figure out, you know, solutions and, and try to help as much as possible. So uh, working collaboratively with them to investigate and determine root cause of problems um, where our systems and assets may overlap and, and just working together to figure out what you know what's the appropriate solution to address the localized flooding. But yes, to your point, uh, we become aware of some of the drainage issues within um, the parks and if it involves any of our assets, um, you know sometimes most times it's a maintenance related matter, so it's a matter of us going out, um, cleaning it and um, Inspecting and cleaning it, um, no different from what we do for our assets within the right of way. Um, but you know, also sometimes parks, a lot of parks have um, uneven topography, and you'll get these lulls in areas that naturally are depressed areas that's going to accumulate stormwater. Okay. And then, and lastly, just want to just ask that you know you continue to keep this body kind of updated on delinquent accounts, cutoffs, anything that especially affect our constituents directly. So that we can just kind of make sure that we're kind of staying aware of, of, of all of that. And then um, just want to thank the women and men of Department of Watershed Management for all your hard work and dedication to the city uh, uh, and providing uh, an essential service that we all need. I think we talked about a couple weeks ago that, you know, water is one of the first things that citizens of Atlanta's probably use that comes, um, you know, as a service. So we just thank you all for your hard work and dedication. So thank you for your presentation today. Thank you for your support. All right, Mr. Johnson, uh, now we'll go into the co consent agenda. Section G, ordinance for first reading. Item number 1-230-1273, an ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2023 Series 2021 Water and Waste Water Commercial Paper Notes Budget in amount of $10 million and zero cents to transfer funds from the Series 2021 Water and wastewater commercial paper notes for appropriations and add funds to the annual sewer contract project and for other purposes. 
Item number two, 2301274. An ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2023 Water and Wastewater Renewal and Extension Fund budget in the amount of $6 million in zero central transfer funds from the watershed reserves for appropriations and add funds to the Program Management Services Team Project and for other purposes. Item number 3, An ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing, authorizing Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2023 23 water and wastewater renewal and extension fund budget an amount of five hundred thousand dollars and zero cents to transfer funds from the watershed reserves for appropriations and to add funds to the advanced metering infrastructure project and for other purposes item number four twenty three oh one two seven six in ordinance by city utilities committee authorizing chief financial officer to amend the fy 2023 water and wastewater renewal and extension fund budget an amount of two million thirty thousand dollars and zero cents to transfer funds from the watershed reserve for appropriations and add funds to the warehouse labeling and barcoding project and for other purposes. Item number 5-230-1277, an ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2023 Series 2021 Water and Wastewater Commercial Paper Notes Budget in amount of $2,500,000 and zero cents to transfer funds from Series 2021 Water and Wastewater Commercial Paper Notes for appropriations and add funds to the valve and hydrant renewal and replacement project and for other purposes. <laughs> Item number 6, 2301278, an ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2023 Series 2021 Water and Wastewater Commercial Paper Notes budget in amount of $2,200,000 and zero cents to transfer funds from the Series 2021 Water and Wastewater Commercial Paper Notes for appropriations to add funds to the Philip Lee Pump Station Bar Screens Upgrade Project and for other purposes. Item number 7-230-1279, an ordinance by City Utilities Committee authorizing Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2023 Water and Wastewater Renewal and Extension Fund budget in amount of $1,500,000 and zero cents to transfer funds from watershed reserves for appropriations and add funds to the lead and copper service line abatement project and for other purposes. Item number A-2301280, an ordinance by City Utilities Committee to ratify services rendered in connection with agreement FC-9838 Program Management Services with Stantec SG Joint Venture beginning May 1st, 2023 through the execution of the Sixth Amendment to authorize the mayor's designee to execute the Sixth, sixth Amendment to the agreement on behalf of the Department of Watershed Management to extend the term of the agreement on a month-to-month -month basis for a period up to 12 months retroactively effective from May 1st, 2023 through April 30th, 2024, and to add funds in an amount not to exceed $6 million and zero cents. All contract work will be charged to and pay from the fund, department, organization, and account numbers listed herein, and for other purposes. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Now we'll go into ordinance for second reading. Um, item number nine. Item number nine, 2301255. An ordinance by Council Member Dustin Hillis authorizing the Chief Financial Officer to amend the FY 2023 Series 2021 Water and Wastewater Commercial Paper Notes budget in the amount of $10 million and zero cents to transfer, paper, to transfer funds from the Series 2021 Water and Wastewater Commercial Paper Notes for appropriations and add funds to the Whittier Mills Sewer Improvement, improvement Projects and for other purposes. Back, Mr. Browning. Hey. Uh, good morning, Chairman Winston, Council Members, Makita Browning, Watershed. Purpose of legislation is to authorize our CFO to amend the FY23 series 2021 water waste water commercial paper in the amount of $10 million uh, to transfer funds and add funds for the Whittier Mill Sewer Improvements Project. Uh, City of Atlanta Department of Watershed Management has identified a need to fund certain costs um, and the purpose of this budget is to fund the project in question. Uh, Whittier Mill Sewer Improvements Project will construct roughly 5,100 linear feet of new gravity, gravity flow public sewers to properly upgrade and serve the Whittier Mills community, which is located in northwest Atlanta. The community is currently served by a deteriorating network of grapevine sewers that are frequently prone to sewer overflows and backups, uh, which poses a threat to the public health and safety of residents. Uh, this legislation will allow DWM to fund a focused project to upgrade the sewers within the community and continue to continue sewer infrastructure improvements in accordance with our consent decree program. Subject to your questions. Thank you, Commissioner Browning. Um, we'll open up for comments. Uh, Councilmember Hillis. Thank you, Mr. Chair, thank you, Commissioner Browning. As we both know, this project's been a long time coming. I remember this project, I think, before being talked about before I was a council member. 
Um, so thank you for your work and your team's work on bringing it this far. I uh, just wanted some additional info that I can share with the community as to uh, this gets the funding, but what is the timeline for the uh, go live on the construction? So this is the uh, first step, putting the funds in place. Um, we will ready, the design is 100%. Uh, so we're ready a trigger package to the procurement department uh, to initiate the procurement phase. Um, with approval of funding, I anticipate we can get that trigger package over to uh, DOP June timeframe. You know, we'll allot a couple of months uh, this summer, I would say probably August time frame to award and um, you know go through legislative approval for award so I would say probably January time frame um, I would say maybe latter part of fall but you know keeping in mind we've got the holidays coming so best bet is for them to start probably January time frame thank you for that and this 10 million covers all of the funding needed for the project including the stormwater phase of the project it includes everything Yes. Thank you very much. Okay. You're welcome. Got a motion to approve by Hillis, second by Dozier. Uh, any other comments before we open the vote? Please open the vote, Mr. Johnson. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six J zero and eight items favorable. <laughs> Sections of section I resolutions. Item number 10, 23R3626. A resolution by City Utilities Committee authorizing the mayor's designee to exercise the first renewal option for a cooperative purchasing agreement for FC 1190642 cellular and wireline wire router services with AT&T Mobility National Accounts LLC utilizing Georgia Technology Authority contract number is listed herein on behalf of the Department of Watershed Management, Atlanta Information, Atlanta Information Management, Atlanta Police Department, and Atlanta Fire Rescue. For a term of one year, effective from July 1st, 2023 through June 30th, 2024, an amount not to exceed $1,319,049.02. All contract work will be charged to and pay from the fund, department, organization, and account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Hey, Mahajer. Hey, good morning. Uh, Alex Mahajer, Office of the Watershed Protection, Mr. Chair, and members of the Council. Um, this is to request uh, authorization to continue business with AT&T wireless and uh, wireline router services as the first year uh, renewal option. The function of this service is to continue transmit monitoring data from remote stations throughout the Department of Watershed Management service area. Further, this is to use for billing, sewer system assessment, rainfall monitoring, sewer spill prevention, sewer capacity certification, consent order, deliverables, and NPDES monitoring requirements. Department of Watershed Management has transmission hardware using network unique to Atlanta Watershed. Changing the services, service providers will require a change of physical hardware in over 285 remote monitoring locations and possible data loss through the transmission process. The current configuration with AT&T was established by AIM, security staff in coordination with AT&T engineers. Any modification to service providers with wireless frequencies will require a project team to vet new uh, work securities on data as well as expenditures on new uh, modems at each monitoring site. This request is, to, uh, is a joint uh, initiative by Department of Watershed Management Atlanta Information Management AIM, Atlanta Police and Fire, with a, low, with a total cost of $1,319,049.02. The original uh, contract term was from February 17, 2019 to June 30, 2022. Then this term was extended from July 1, 2022 to June 30, 2023, with four one-year renewal option. This is the request to exercise the first renewal option from July 1st, 2023 to June 30th, 2024. Thank you, DC Mahajer. Um, any questions or comments from my colleagues? We've got a motion to approve by Shook. So we have a second by Hillis. You still open. Please open the vote. The vote is open.
The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays. The item is favorable. Item number 1123R3627, a resolution by City Utilities Committee authorizing the mayor as needed to execute an agreement for IFB DWM 2208-123-0036, Peace Street Creek West Side Project 2A with Ruby Collins Incorporated on behalf of the Department of Watershed Management for a term for phase one to commence on the date a notice to proceed is issued for a period of 183 calendar days and amount not to exceed $995,000.00. All contract work will be charged to and paid from the fund, department, organization, and account numbers listed herein and for other purposes. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. And before we get to Commissioner Brown and colleagues, uh, in your supplemental material, there is an IPRO report to attach to this. So I'd like to make a motion to amend uh, to add the IPRO report. I have a second by Dozier. Can you please open the vote? The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six J's, zero nays. This item is, has been amended. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Browning. Okay. Good. Good. Good morning, still. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, Chairman Winston and Council Members Makita Browning. Uh, purpose of this legislation is to execute an agreement uh, for the Peachtree Creek Westside Project 2A with Ruby Collins Inc. on behalf of the Department of Watershed Management for Phase 1 to commence. Um, as part of the ongoing initiative to meet the requirements of the consent decrees, uh, DWM has further refined and developed scopes of work for necessary capacity relief projects within the Peachtree Creek Sewer Basin. Uh, the agreement is structured as a progressive design bill contract uh, with services provided under the agreement funded and managed in two distinct phases. So phase one involves the design services for up to 60% design, uh, which the work will be approved by this resolution. Uh, for the contractor to initiate and then phase two is set forth in section 3.3 of the agreement it's a contract price for phase two should be developed um, under phase one um, as an open book basis uh, the project consists of approximately 16,900 linear feet of replacement sewer ranging in size from 12 inches to 15 inches to provide collection system capacity relief in the western portion of Peachtree Creek Basin uh, there's a number of capacity relief projects included uh, with the west side um, sewer segment replacements um, that have been defined by our hydraulic model um, to address peak wet weather flows and reduce sewer spills. Uh, this legislation again will allow DWM to fund phase one of the project and continue to upgrades to our city's sewer system. Um, subject to your questions. Thank you, Commissioner Browning. Um, Councilmember Hillis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Browning. Is this in District 8, 9, the approximate location of this large project? So there's several um, small projects that make up it, so I'd have to go back, but it's, it's in uh, northern Atlanta. Yeah, project map with whatever. Absolutely. Affected. We'll get that for you. Most to approve as amended six, by six, Hillis. Seven. We got a second by Dozier. Can you please open the vote? Six, six, seven. The vote is open. The vote is closed. Six J zero nays. This item is favorable as amended. Mr. Chair, we have one walk-in paper. Uh, Section K walk-in legislation, Elms ID number 32715, a resolution by City Utilities Committee authorizing the mayor as designee to enter into the fourth amendment to agreement RFPS 1210111, Green Infrastructure and Landscape Services with ECL slash RAC Joint Venture on beh behalf of the Department of Public Works, an amount not to exceed $150,000.00 for fiscal year 23 and $2,400,000.00 for fiscal year 24 for right of way maintenance and routine landscaping activities. All contract work will be charged to and pay from the fund department and accounts listed herein and for other purposes. Commissioner Wiggins. Good morning, Chairman Winston and committee members. Al Wiggins, Commissioner of Public Works. Um, this legislation is to cover uh, the possibility of a shortfall of landscape services uh, for this coming summer. Uh, through the inspections that were performed uh, with our quality assurance team, we have some concerns that this contractor that we're using exclusively at this point 
may not have the bandwidth to cover the uh, miles of right of way that um, um, that's required for this this growing season. So, you know, out of an abundance of caution, we've just asked that this committee consider allowing us to bring on another provider um, to assist with right of way maintenance. Um, as you know, we're in the process of submitting a bid to contract this work out permanently, which is scheduled to be uh, submitted sometime in August, I believe. So the need is, is not is just for a finite period of time, uh, just to make sure that we're covered uh, should we experience any unforeseen circumstances. Thank you. And um, I'll just start by saying, obviously, there, you know, we had a pretty uh, spirited debate here about eight months ago uh, about this contract provider and just wanted to know if you can provide an update um, just based on where we are with quality control services rendered and just the overall sentiment of how they're performing right now. So um, the, the contractor that we are asking to go into an agreement with now is Ed Castro Landscaping. Much of our discussions have been surrounded by the work that was performed by Russell Landscaping. Um, I will say that Russell Landscaping, their work has improved tremendously um, as they work with our quality assurance team to ensure that the work is being performed according to the standards of our contract. However, with the improvement of their work, it has uh, slowed down their productivity um, significantly. So this is why we're asking to bring another provider on just so um, if they continue to perform work at the rate um, that they are currently, we anticipate that there will be a reduction in productivity is the reason that we're asking that Ed Castro be brought on under the uh, green waste contract that's currently sponsored by the Department of Watershed Management. Okay. Um, I will uh, open it up. Uh, Councilmember Hillis. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Wiggins. So we currently have who doing this work? Ed Castro and Russell? So currently, Russell Landscaping is doing um, the arterial roads exclusively. Um, our full-time staff members are doing the collective streets and some of our local roads. And so we're just simply asking for Ed Castro to be able to assist with doing uh, some of the collective streets, which was part of our original strategy until the original PO was exhausted. We thought we would be able to, to wait until the work was permanently bidded out before we brought Ed Castro back into um, consideration. So again, August will be the time frame that we're expecting to have the work permanently bidded out. Um, but until then, we just want to make sure that there aren't any gaps in services, um, just considering the rate of productivity that Russell Landscape is, is currently able to produce. So this paper is for an additional 2.4 million. So I believe this is 1.5, if I remember correctly. Um, let me go back and look at that. Package. One part in here says 150,000. And, and an amount not to exceed $150,000 for FY23 and 2 million. 400,000 for FY24. That's correct. That's correct. That's so correct. Actually, 2.55 million. Right. Um, and, and just to, papers to, to provide some clarity there is that we don't anticipate needing the funding for uh, going into FY24. That's when the work would be bidded out. But should we experience any type of delays through the procurement process, um, is the reason that we added that on just as a, a fail safe mechanism. Where is that procurement paper currently? Um, Has it been uh, bid? It's with DOP now. They put it out on the street or are they? It, it has not been uh, placed for public bid yet, but it is with DOP as part of the review process. But it has not been released. I, know, I know there's been a lot of improvement, but I don't think they're going to get an RFP pushed out and bids back and reviewed and awarded by fiscal year 24. That starts in what, five weeks. 
No, I'm not saying immediately at the at the very beginning of the, the budget process. I'm saying sometime before within the next two to three months, we're hoping that we would get that work bidded out. But that is the reason that we added additional funding should for some unforeseen circumstances that um, there would be some delay that would prevent us from being able to get the work accomplished. And so if this is approved and awarded that division of work is going to be like it was or like we were told it was supposed to be um, a year or so ago that Russell's going to handle arterials and Castro is going to handle collectors and not come in here and tell us that he's only doing one street. Well, not necessarily. It just depends who would be the successful bidder, but we do anticipate that the work would be segmented um, between arterial roads and collector streets. So we have a few options that will be presented in that bid package. That's one option. And then the other option is for us to have um, a territory approach as well. So this paper, if approved, this money could either be used for uh, ECL or Russell? That's correct. Okay. And so what has their performance been recently? And when did ECL stop doing collectors? So Russell is in the 80% range as far as the inspections at this point. But again, after they have reached that level, it has slowed down their productivity. Um, before the PO was exhausted for a Castro, they were performing in that 80% range as well. Just keep in mind uh, during the initial inspection process that both contractors um, were not receiving passing scores um, because we were really rating them and their work strictly according to the terms of the contract, whether it be you know, the edging of sidewalks or picking up litter prior to mowing. Um, and so our QAQ and C inspectors were inspecting, you know, the details down to the, the letter of the contract. And so we're proud to say that they have met that expectation. Not only have we used that scoring criteria for our outside providers, we use that scoring criteria for our full-time employees as well. Um, initially, they were struggling a little bit. They did not receive failing scores because they understand the standard um, probably a little bit better because we have over the shoulder supervision as opposed to what was provided to uh, the contractors. So uh, city employees as well as the outside contractors are consistently scoring in that 80% range at this time. So as of today, not considering this legislation, who's currently performing work? Just Russell? Russell is the only outside provider, um, but our teams are performing uh, work on the art, excuse me, oh, yeah. the collective uh, I know they are. I've seen, seen them out doing stuff that Ed Castro is supposed to be taking care of. I, I mentioned that to you uh, yes, yesterday. I saw that coming into City Hall. Um, on the, um, lost my train of thought, but you know, I just have concerns about this. I've seen Russell out working. Uh, they haven't been doing what they told me they were going to do six months ago. We've had that discussion about their quote-unquote off-season work that they were going to do during the winter, uh, which they haven't done yeah. on Bolton Road, a major arterial street that sees 17,000 vehicles per day. Uh, looks like hell. Um, I don't know that I've ever seen Ed Castro working in District 9. So. So I, I share your concerns, and I can tell you that this legislation will help to address productivity. I am very comfortable with saying that any work that has been performed by Russell, um, it has met our standard. We are, we're inspecting 85 to 90 percent of their work. And um, at, at this point, again, the work that is being performed has been acceptable. However, it has just slowed down their productivity significantly. And Bolton Road, Bolton Road and the other areas that you mentioned that they have not had the opportunity to service has been a result of the rate of their service being slowed down because we've required them to improve the quality of work uh, that's provided.
I think my last question is where are each both ECL and Russell at right now? Because if I got Russell and complain, it's well, it's all not necessarily your fault. It's procurement's fault or finances fault because there's no PO. They haven't got paid in so long. Right. And then you know if I come present that, you know it's well, it's a quality issue, and that's why we haven't paid them. This is not on their invoice, et cetera. So it's one yeah. pointing to the other, and we just right. want to get our streets cleaned up and taken care of. That's right. Um, so Ed Castro hasn't performed work um, since the conclusion of the last calendar year. So it's, it's been quite a while since Ed Castro has done work for the Department of Public Works. Um, Council Member Hill is, but if there isn't an, an area of right of way service, um, I'm the manager, it falls squarely on my shoulders. So regardless of the finger pointing, it, it falls on me and I'll, I'll take personal responsibility if um, the work is not being performed according to the, our commitments and the schedule. But in order for us to be able to- They also have a responsibility. They're getting paid to I, do something. Yes, sir, I, I agree. Um, but I, I really need your assistance with bringing in another provider to be able to increase our ability to, to increase productivity. I will say out of um, consistent consistency, I was going to say fairness, that's not the word I would like to use, but for consistency, they are learning our new, our standard that's that's being enforced. And it's, it's a testament to our quality assurance, quality control team that they are making sure that the work is being performed. And they're, um, the amount of right of way that has to be covered um, throughout the city, we have um, almost 1,500 miles, center lane miles of right of way, and we cover both sides of the roads. And so that's considering that's the equivalent of driving from Atlanta beyond San Francisco. So it's a huge undertaking, and and just being vulnerable of having one provider um, causes great concern for me. <coughs> I'll just ask that you know if this gets approved, that you take uh, Mr. Castro out and show him all the roads that he's going to be tasked with and give him it, give it to him in black and white so if he ever comes back in here, he doesn't claim that he's only been told to take care of one street. That was quite absurd, but um, so I'll, I'll yield to my colleagues. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hillis. Um, next, we'll have comments and questions from uh, Councilmember Lewis. And so, thank you. My, uh, my questions were first around uh, this, so what road, could you tell us the exact roads in my district that you don't have to tell me now that the, that they will be taken care of? Could we? Get so the, the, the best example I can give you, the arterial roads in your district would be um, Cleveland Avenue, Metropolitan, and a collector street. Um, I was trying to think of a collector street. Um, you know, I'm not sure if, McDon yeah, McDonough maybe. Um, a, a better example. Um, but even though that is the schedule um, and our approach, our strategy for getting the work accomplished, we really need to bring another provider in if Russell, um, for some reason, and they're experiencing the same challenges that, as we are as far as um, the, uh, the labor pool and the folks that are available to do the work. So we may have to pull a Castro in to assist with performing work on the arterial roads. Um, I'm, I'm confident in saying that the work that is being performed and being scored by our quality assurance, uh, quality control inspectors is, is, is being um, properly evaluated at this point. I, I think had we not introduced the quality assurance and quality control inspectors, the rate of productivity would have been as it were in previous years, but I've heard from you know several members of this body about you know the quality of work and and um, how it was not done favorably, and and that's what we've addressed, and that's what really slowed down productivity. Okay, I want I wanted to make sure. So now we have Castro, Russell, City of Atlanta, and. Uh, and the folks we're talking about now, so that's four, and I have CEO, so five folks helping to clean up the dish, clean up our city of Atlanta, the 1,500 miles. So the, the city has our full-time equivalent 
currently at Russell Landscaping, and hopefully um, we will be able to add uh, Ed Castro. So that would be three for the Department of Public Works. And as you mentioned, you're, you're using CEO works for special projects within your district. So that would be four providers. And, and ideally, you know, a city of our size, is, it wouldn't be unusual for us to have a half a dozen providers. Um, from a management perspective, I, I do have some concerns about adding that many. Um, but again, this is a new model. And what, what has really changed is introducing the quality insurance, quality control office. And so I, would, I wish we could bring it all back to in-house, but we can't. And so my goal is to know that if I can know when they will be out, because if we got four to five providers or three to four providers in the city, my grass shouldn't grow as high as it's growing in streets. And so I would also like for them to cut around the trees, make and drive. I'm about to drive down it again today. Uh, you can see where they are cutting, but not around the trees. So there are big hashes growing on make and drive uh, right now today. And I see they're actually out there working right now and they're not cutting around the trees on make and drive. Also, on Macon and Polar Rock Place, they used to cut the grass all the way down to the road up to the tree line. They've stopped. Can we please get them to continue all the way back to the, to the place? And lastly, could I get a schedule of when grass would, what, when things would be taken care of in District 12? That's, that way I could easily send it out. Thank you. Yes, sir. So, Councilmember Lewis, just for, for context, on the arterial roads, our schedule is to cut those roads twice a month. Um, and so the schedule, we will certainly provide you a schedule. We have that, and it's actually integrated into a mobile application that we use. But sometimes weather um, causes a delay, and we're not able to get to those roads on that precise day. But most of the time, we're able to service that road within that, that week. So I just wanted to to give you that disclaimer. Even if it's just a week, uh, what, what I would like to know, because I cut my grass twice a month, so I would like that we would feel good with that in our district. So tell us the week that it'd be cut so people can move. We're, I don't know if they uh, do it in other parts of the city. Uh, sometimes folks pa park their cars out on the side of the street. Uh, similar to, we have seen street sweepers. Uh, for I appreciate you for sending street sweepers through. Tell us when they're coming. Because uh, I had folks who had their cars out there and it was a good problem that no street sweepers were coming. But uh, Mario and Polar Rock said, man, I wish I would have known, known a day before because I would have moved my car. It's and if I, I would like to kind of explain it also. So our goal is to, to uh, sweep every street once a quarter. Um, there are times that we, we may have to handle a one-off request. And so you may see that truck in a neighborhood and it wasn't scheduled to be there, right? And that, that does cause some confusion and, and we, we want to find a way to work around that through our communications team. But we do have on-street signage that we're putting out. We're working with our communications team as well to add additional signage that we can attach to um, utility structures and trees as well. And, and the, lastly, Peg Road, if I can get some attention on Peg Road, uh, Peg Road off Metropolitan Parkway. Get some attention on Peg Road. Thank you, Chair. Move approval. If Thank you, Councilmember Lewis. We have a, a motion to approve from Lewis. Do we have a second, a second by Boone. Um, Commissioner Wiggins, I just want to you know reiterate some of the the points made by my colleagues. I think communication is key here, and clearly being able to articulate to us who's responsible for what. Um, you know, working as closely as you can with us on schedules. If you know, knowing the constraints around weather and some other issues, but I think that's something that's really important for us to kind of know going forward. Um, and just, you know, communication, that's all I can reiterate. Yes, yes, sir, Chair. We will certainly make sure that the this body has a copy of the, the right-of-way maintenance schedule. Um, it's also posted on the DPW's website. There is a margin for errors typically, you know, plus or minus a week, um, you know, due to inclement weather. But we will make sure that we send that schedule out directly to this body. Thank you. Um, Mr. Johnson, can you please open the book? Vote is open. The vote is closed. Six yeas, zero nays, items favorable. Mr. Chair, that concludes our legislative items for today.
Thank you, everyone. Uh, if there's any, are there any pardon words or comments from my colleagues? Uh, Councilmember Hillis. Mr. Wiggins, um, that was a hard to vote yes on that, but I want you to have the, I don't want that to be another one of their excuses that, you know, we don't have the funding. Can we please get an update from uh, our procurement chief as to the status of that bid package and when that's going out and kind of a timeline? As we've been working off this emergency contract for a few years now. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? If not, thank you, everyone. We stand adjourned.